For a time, Animal Farm prospers and the animals are pleased to benefit from their labour. The animals were happy as they had never conceived it possible to be. Every mouthful of food was an acute, positive pleasure, now that it was truly their own food, produced by themselves and for themselves, not doled out to them by a grudging master. With the worthless, parasitical human beings gone, there was more for everyone to eat. Boxer, who adopts the motto, I will work harder, becomes an inspiration for the other animals. It seems that the entire farm rests on his mighty shoulders. His friend Benjamin, on the other hand, is cynical about the revolution. When asked whether he was not happier now that Jones was gone, he would only say, Donkeys live a long time. None of you has ever seen a dead donkey. And the others had to be content with this cryptic answer. In this chapter, the rivalry between Napoleon and Snowball intensifies. Snowball and Napoleon were by far the most active in the debates, but it was noticed that these two were never in agreement. Whatever suggestion either of them made, the other could be counted on to oppose it. Even when it was resolved, a thing that no one could object to in itself to set aside the small paddock behind the orchard as a home of rest for animals who were past work, there was a stormy debate over the correct retiring age for each class of animal. In this chapter, it is revealed that the pigs are taking the milk and apples for themselves. Squealer steps in and persuades the other animals that this is necessary for the prosperity of the farm. You do not imagine, I hope, that we pigs are doing this in a spirit of selfishness and privilege. Many of us actually dislike milk and apples. I dislike them myself. Our sole objective in taking these things is to preserve our health. Milk and apples, this has been proved by science, comrades, contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. We pigs are brain workers. The whole management and organisation of this farm depends on us. Day and night we're watching over your welfare. It is for your sake that we drink that milk and eat those apples. Do you know what would happen if we pigs failed in our duty? Jones would come back. In this chapter, the animals create their own flag, which is green and features a hoof and horns. The flag was green, Snowball explained, to represent the green fields of England while the hoof and horn signified the future republic of the animals, which would arise when the human race had been finally overthrown. The hoof and horn are, of course, reminiscent of the hammer and sickle that adorned the Russian flag. This chapter also demonstrates how totalitarian governments use propaganda to maintain control. Whenever the pigs do something unpopular that unfairly benefits themselves, Squealer puts forward a very persuasive argument convincing them that it's in their best interest. When the animals discover that the pigs are taking the apples and milk for themselves, Squealer convinces them that they're brain workers and that it's necessary for the whole management and organisation of the farm. In the Soviet era, propaganda was used extensively to inspire people to believe in their country and their leader. The sheep, who in this chapter mindlessly repeat the phrase four legs good, two legs bad, represent the masses who are easily swayed by propaganda. Orwell was suspicious of such sloganeering. In Why Orwell Matters, Christopher Hitchens wrote, He was fond of drawing attention to the surreptitious importing of received opinions through political slogans and advertising jingles, and the way in which people fell into the trap of expressing conventional thoughts that did not really belong to them. Orwell was concerned that these slogans both drown out intelligent debate and also become convenient ways of thinking. In the essay Politics and the English Language, he wrote, When you think of something abstract, you're more inclined to use words from the start unless you make a conscious effort to prevent it. The existing dialect will come rushing in and do the job for you, at the expense of blurring or even changing your meaning. Throughout Animal Farm, propaganda plays an important role in strengthening the pig's control over the farm. In this chapter, rivalry between Snowball and Napoleon, who represent early leaders of the USSR, Leon Trotsky and Joseph Stalin, intensifies. When the first leader of the USSR, Vladimir Lenin, died, there was a power struggle between Trotsky and Stalin. Trotsky was ultimately exiled and Stalin became the leader of the country. And now we're going to have a little bit more of a casual conversation about Chapter 3. As usual, you'll need a pen or some sort of highlighter to mark important quotes in the novel, and also, obviously, a copy of the book. Now, I was asked the other day, uh, in terms of Animal Farm, what are some of the uh, quotes that I should be looking for? And basically, anything that will help you to engage in an intelligent discussion about the book. And I think some of the things that Orwell explores in this novel include that idea of violence and fear. So anything related to the way the pigs use violence to manipulate the other animals, 
that idea of power and corruption, so the way the pigs complete power over the farm, ultimately corrupts them. The idea of propaganda and the abuse of language. Uh, anytime Squealer gets out there and is trying to persuade the animals that uh, what the pigs are doing is in their interests. Uh, and also that idea of the abuse of language, so the, the way language can be twisted. And three ideas that I've lumped together, passivity, ignorance, and cynicism. I think in the novel, uh, Orwell is kind of commenting on how passive people can be in the face of this sort of um, totalitarianism or this sort of authoritarian rule. The, the role that ignorance plays as well, because uh, there's no questioning that some of the animals are, are quite ignorant. And also cynicism, because characters like Benjamin, uh, many people suggest that Benjamin represents Orwell. And while I might agree that Orwell was quite cynical, I don't think he was passive. And I think the character of Benjamin is very much a warning um, about succumbing to uh, that cynicism and expecting the worse and how uh, damaging that can ultimately be. So when it comes to chapter three, let's have a look at some of the um, important passages that I've marked. Uh, to start off with, at the very beginning of the chapter, of course, the, the revolution is still quite young at this point in the novel, and their efforts were re rewarded. So they're actually reaping the benefit of um, taking over and um, getting rid of Farmer Jones. What's interesting as well is this idea that the pigs did not actually work but directed and supervised the others. So even at the beginning, the pigs have installed themselves as kind of a, uh, a ruling class on the farm. And that hierarchy, um, you know, the pigs lording over the animals, is already exists really. The sense of optimism at the beginning of this chapter is still evident when Orwell writes, the animals were happy as they had never conceived it possible to be. Every mouthful of food was an acute positive pleasure now that it was truly their own food produced by themselves and for themselves, not doled out to them. Uh, by a grudging master. Ultimately, the death of Boxer is the most tragic thing that happens in this novel. And in this chapter, Orwell is setting him up as the admiration of everybody. And that's a little quotation that I've underlined there. And there's a very lengthy discussion of his contribution to the work on the farm. The entire work of the farm seemed to rest upon his mighty shoulders. From morning to night, he was pushing and pulling, always at the spot where the work was hardest. He'd made an arrangement with one of the cockerels to call him in the mornings um, half an hour earlier than everybody else and would put in some volunteer labour at whatever seemed to be the most needed before the regular day's work began. His answer to every problem, every setback was, I will work harder, which he had adopted as his personal motto. And again, Benjamin comes into this chapter in quite a big way. Uh, on the next page, I've underlined this phrase. Old Benjamin the donkey seemed quite unchanged since the rebellion. He did his work in the same slow, obstinate way he had done in Jones's time, never shrinking and never volunteering for extra work either. About the rebellion and its results, he would express no opinions. When asked whether he was happier now that Jones was gone, he would only say, donkeys live a long time. None of you has ever seen a dead donkey. And the others had to be content with his cryptic answer. I really think that Benjamin represents Orwell's cynicism, his expectation that uh, things aren't necessarily going to get better. But I don't necessarily think that that is something that Orwell believed. I think he believed we can do something about uh, this sort of thing. We can do something to uh, work towards a fairer society. Remember, we're talking about the guy who... Uh, fought in the Spanish Civil War and got shot in the throat. I think, if anything, the character of Benjamin represents the worst of Orwell's nature, and he's really writing about the fact that um, he has to struggle with this cynicism um, and the fact that things might not change. Because ultimately, uh, Benjamin does nothing about their situation and pays the price by the end of the book by losing his dearest friend. That idea of the animals being passive and doing very, very little to um, help their situation kind of comes through in this chapter to an extent. When Orwell writes, it was always the pigs who put forward the resolutions. The other animals understood how to vote, but could never think of any resolutions of their own. And I think what Orwell is arguing is that we need to be active in politics. We need to defend our interests and we need to become involved in these things. Or, unfortunately, we're going to end up like the animals in Animal Farm and it's going to be awful. There's also quite a lengthy passage in this chapter where uh, the animals are attempting to learn to read and most of them find it very difficult. Um, like Boxer, for example. 
And I think there's an extent to which the pigs uh, manipulate uh, this ignorance. And of course, it's in this chapter that uh, the sheep learn how to say uh, the single maxim, four legs good, two legs bad. Uh, And again, Orwell was very suspicious of this sort of sloganeering, uh, this idea that uh, these slogans and this sort of very simplistic propaganda would influence the way that people thought about politics and that you really have to struggle to break away from this and to think in depth about particular issues. And the sheep can keep up chanting this uh, slogan for hours, which reminds me a lot of certain uh, political rallies. And what I find very interesting about um, Squealer's discussion about the pigs taking the milk and apples for themselves is the way that it ends. And the sense that the pigs really do rely on the fear of Farmer Jones returning uh, to keep the animals in line. And Squealer's speech uh, ends with that question, surely there is no one among you who wants to see Jones coming back. So that's it. That's chapter three. Now it's time to go do some writing. Now I'm going to get you to do a single paragraph of writing on this chapter. You're going to reflect on the following topic. In Animal Farm, the pigs are able to control the other animals because they are passive, docile, and naive. Do you agree? I'd like you to particularly focus on this chapter before you start find a clear definition of what passive, docile, and naive mean. Then look for examples in this chapter. When you're writing a response, as always, use a teal paragraph. Begin with a topic sentence explaining your stance on the topic. Do you agree that the animals are passive and docile? Then give a bit of explanation. Explain how the animals might be passive, docile and naive in this chapter. And of course, throughout the response, you need to support your writing with evidence. Uh, Short quotations from this chapter used in sentences of your own are usually the best. At the end of the paragraph, I'd like you to close off with a sentence that links back to the topic. I hope you enjoyed that look at chapter three. Thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.